Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Homestand Podcast, the official podcast of the Kansas City Royals. I'm your host, Carrie Lipper Gillespie. I'm so happy you're here today, and I am so happy to welcome our guest, Royals outfielder MJ Melendez. Nice to be here. I am glad to have you here today. You know, we've had some of your other teammates on before. What have they told you? Are you scared of us? Like, how are you feeling right now? Oh, I'm terrified. Yeah, I just, <laughs> I've heard so many horror stories. It's, yeah, not been good. You go by MJ, but your real name is Merville. A lot of the guys call you Merv. Like, what's the nickname basis that you go by? Who calls you what? And what do you prefer? Yeah, I feel like around the baseball field, everybody calls me Merv. Like, um, even the coaching staff. Uh, so that's something that, you know, started honestly ever since pro ball, uh, because back home, like nobody ever really called me Merv. Everybody called me MJ. Um, pretty much all my friends call me MJ still back home, but I feel like my, all my teammates here, it's like a baseball thing. Honestly, everybody calls me Merv, but I like it. I like them both. Yeah. I see on your batting gloves, it says Merv, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. That was something that I customized, um, because I still was like, yeah, I kind of wanted to have something unique, and it's a cool nickname. And that's what everybody calls my dad, so that's why nobody back home really calls me that. Yeah. So, uh, but I like it. You're a junior just like just like Bobby is. Exactly. So he, I think at home he was telling me his family calls him Bob, but here like he's more Bobby. So like when you're around your dad, everyone calls you MJ, right? Oh, 100%, okay. yeah. So it was funny because on the on the dad's trip, um, <laughs> people would say Merv, like he would be with me like <laughs> on the bus or whatever, and he would turn around and he was like, oh, I got to stop doing that. I forgot <laughs> that people call you that now. Yeah, that's so funny. Well, I want to talk some about where you grew up and what your life was like as a child because your dad played. He's a coach for a while, but you moved around quite a bit because of where he was coaching. So like, where do you consider home? Because I know you lived in Alabama for a while. Yeah, no, definitely Florida's home. Um, born, in, born in Daytona Beach, was there until I was 12 years old. Uh, then my dad got a coaching job in Alabama. So we moved there. I was there from, I want to say it was seventh grade to 11th. And then my senior year in Miami and been in Miami ever since. But I would say Florida's home. Obviously, two different cities in Florida now, more Miami, and that's, you know, the latter part of my life since being drafted and whatnot, so I feel like Miami is home for me. Was it hard to move around? I mean, at that point, you are you have friends, you have routines, like, was it hard as, like, a teen to be kind of pulled from what you knew and, and head back somewhere else? I think the first move was the hardest. Yeah. Um, sixth grade, middle school, right after that, you're kind of getting used to it, and, and you move to a completely different state. Um not only a different state, just like everything is so, so different, like Alabama and Florida, like you can kind of already imagine it's just a whole different dynamic. Um, but I feel like it, it kind of got easier and uh, I think it helped with my transition into Pro Bowl, uh, being able to be in different environments, move and get adjusted to new people, uh, especially, you know, like last one before my senior year of high school, like most important year. Um, it was It was definitely pretty crazy, but I think everybody at my school in, in Miami definitely helped made that transition a lot easier. Now, did you play other sports besides baseball? Were you a football player too? Yeah, yeah. So that was so I was one of the things my dad both my parents honestly, but especially my dad, he was like, You're never playing football, like you're never doing that. Basketball was like maybe, but I wasn't that good at basketball. Um, I was okay, but when we moved to Alabama I was like, Hey, I'm gonna need to play football because if I don't, then I'm not going to meet new people. Like that's my way of meeting new friends. Everybody, all the like athlete, all the athletic kids all played football. Uh, so I played football and basketball right when we moved from seventh grade. Uh, I played football until after my sophomore year. I didn't play my junior year and then basketball my freshman year. I didn't play my sophomore year. It's so cool that you had that foresight, like even when you're pretty young to be like, look, Playing is one thing, but like I'm going to meet people and make friends and like this is going to be like one of my avenues to do that. Like it's pretty impressive. You had that foresight when you were that young. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was it was definitely like the like the first thing on my mind when we moved. It was like once I got into school, I was like, OK, I need to do this. This is what everybody's doing. Like this is gonna be my way to meet people. And then also it was like a, that good excuse because I always wanted to play football and uh, ended up like being a quarterback and whatnot and it was a uh, it was a really cool experience I was just gonna ask what position you were so you were a quarterback yeah quarterback um, and then I played a little bit of uh, of corner as well defensive back um, but mainly just quarterback yeah so was baseball like even though you played other sports was baseball always the plan I would assume so because your dad was a coach yeah yeah definitely it was always a plan and it was always what I was best at so um, not that I, I feel like if I could have worked hard and made football, basketball, I'm way too short. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, baseball was always my passion, my love, and uh, I, I couldn't really imagine playing anything else. 
Was your dad one of your coaches growing up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was. He coached me in, uh, ever since I can remember when I was just younger. Uh, and then he was like my travel ball coach from, I want to say like s- seven or eight U, uh, all the way up till I think like 15. And then uh, we moved away and I guess there's like these rules where, because he was coaching all of us and I guess you can't coach like people in high school, like when you're a college coach, unless they're in like a certain mile radius. Oh, so. sure. So uh, he ended up not being able to do that, but pretty much my whole life, yeah. Okay, so I'm really curious about this because I know the father-son dynamic can be hard when it's player-coach. So, But I also know that you're close with your dad. So it must have been good for you like to have both, but was it tough at times to go from this is my coach to then going home and being like, this is my dad? Like, What was that like? I think the hardest thing is just I'm like very stubborn and hard headed. So whenever he would tell me stuff, I would just take it like him being my dad instead of my coach. Whereas like if he said something and then like another coach told me another coach that like I I really trusted, like told me the same thing. I would like listen to the other coach. (laughs) But then if my dad said I would give him a hard time about it, not that I wouldn't listen to him, but I would definitely give him a way harder time. Yeah. I think that's normal, so I don't blame you too much for that. Yeah, no, it's uh, it like that dynamic is it's like very strange. Like a lot of people ask that, but it's like at the end of the day, he's my dad. And yeah, even though he's my coach, sometimes it's it's a lot harder to be like, okay, yeah, I'm just gonna listen right away. Like it's a coach. Like, not that I don't respect him, obviously I do, but that's just. I, I know I'm, I just give I, I give him a harder time about it. Yeah. Did you have certain times when you would have to have like a stop of when you would turn it off? Like, is there a rule like at the dinner table there was like no talking about baseball or like was there any rule like that? <laughs> I don't I don't. That's a good one. Um, I don't think there's ever been a time where he feels like he can't just bring up <laughs> baseball, <laughs> which sometimes now I tell like when I was younger, I wouldn't really say anything. But now I tell him like, hey, today we're not talking about baseball. So, but he knows now, like that's, I think that kind of started in pro ball. I was like, Hey, you know, I want to decompress from baseball. I've been at the field all day long. That's just like the last thing I want to talk about or think about. So now him, um, and my mom, they both understand now because my mom will like talk about baseball a lot too, just cause she's been around there her yeah. whole life too. So, um, but no, he, uh, he, he kind of understands like, okay, when I want to talk about baseball and when I don't. Yeah. So you must have liked playing for him because when you were in college or I'm sorry, when you were in high school, you committed to play at FIU, which is where he was coaching. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that ever since I was younger. So just seeing him make it to, you know, conference tournaments, one of those conference tournaments, making it to regionals um, and just seeing like how hard he worked. I was like, I can never help another coach get to that point. You want to try to go to the College World Series. Like I can't do that when I see my dad has been working his whole coaching career to get to that point. So I'm like, why would I, and he taught me everything. So why would I go try to help some other coach, you know, get to that point when I've seen my dad try to get there his whole career. Now you didn't end up going there because you were drafted uh, in the second round in 2017. So was it hard to like realize that you weren't going to be able to help him get to one of his dreams? Yeah, it was tough. Um, Even that, that draft day was, was kind of crazy. I, uh, I remember just thinking to myself, I was like, okay, well, you know, obviously every every player wants to be a first rounder, and I was like, you know, I want obviously I would love to be a first rounder. If I'm a second rounder, you know, that's good too. As long as you know, I feel like the team really wants me, then you know, that's where I want to go. Um, but it did get to a point at, at that draft day where I was like, man, I don't know if I'm going to get picked, and I was like, if I don't, I don't get you know what I'm asking for. I I definitely can see myself going and playing college, and it was sort of like a it was like a, a point in time where it was like both could happen, but I was like, realistically, I can really see myself, you know, this might be it. I might be going to college if, if this doesn't happen in the next couple of picks. So uh, it was a crazy day and it was uh, obviously bittersweet because, you know, I was signing pro, but I really did want to go play for my dad. And I'm sure he was excited for you. Like yeah, a your lot of dream people, is coming true. And a lot of people asked, a lot of people was like, oh, like, was he disappointed? Did he want you to go to college? And I was like, no, he was like a dad in that point. He just any like any other dad who wouldn't want their son to, you know, go sign and, and play pro ball. So uh, he was definitely happy. Yeah. And you if you think about it like this, like he's coaching kids in college so that they can get to pro ball and like you've just gotten to pro ball. So like you skipped a step, but like you're doing ultimately what he's helping like other young men do. Yeah, exactly. So. Exactly. So he's that's I mean, that's his goal. I know when he was coaching, his biggest thing was, you know, uh, you know, turning these these kids, these you know high schoolers, going into college, turning them into grown men, like teaching themselves on and off the field. Um, 
obviously like one thing that was important to him also was like grades Mm -hmm. um so he was big on like academics you know making sure uh they were doing things the right way and uh i mean it was it was a great it was great to see because obviously i saw what he how he you know was a father at home but also like he was had like that same passion um and love to his players that he has like at home so when you were drafted by the Royals, had you been to Kansas City? Did you know anything about Kansas City before they picked you? So, yeah, I actually came out here for a pre-draft workout, um, and I was, like, super sick on the flight here. It was horrible. My area scout, um, Alex Mesa, who's, um, you know, he's doing some stuff in the DR now, um, but he was here. He was, like, took care of me. He took my dad to a... Uh, I think it was like a Walgreens or CVS at like midnight when we got in and like got me a bunch of stuff because I was just so under the weather. And uh, the next morning I was still like kind of eh, but then we had that the the pre-draft workout. So I grinded through it. Um, it definitely was a little tough because of how I was feeling. But that was uh, that was the only time I had been to Kansas City ever. And uh, it was definitely – like a pretty crazy thing you know looking back on it now being like you know I took BP at the field and didn't hit any home runs and I was (laughs) like wow this is embarrassing (laughs) it's a big field I mean it is it is it is a big field and I was like man I was like I can't get anything out of here I was like that day too like not a lot of people were hitting the ball out but um I think uh Brewer Hicklin was was there that day and uh and there was a couple other there was a couple other guys that I remember getting drafted, um, but uh, yeah, it was it was really cool. Now you have a brother, Jaden. Yep, little brother. He's also a, a baseball player. He plays at Pitt, right? He does. He does. Yeah, he's uh just finished his sophomore year at Pitt. Um, he had transferred uh, there last year, and uh, he's enjoying. He actually likes the cold. Um, yeah, hence the reason why he's at Pitt. Mm. He, I don't know why. So, well, actually, I do know why. He apparently likes the cold because his hands don't sweat as much and he's like oh like I don't have to play and you know I have to have dirt in my hands always to like absorb the sweat so he's like it's just easier like that and he enjoys it and he had a good season so hey what is your relationship with like him when it comes to I know you read like when he does something good you're retweeting him all the time like I know you're his biggest fan (laughs) do you ever like have to stop yourself from trying to coach him or does he ask you for advice what's that like um he definitely asked me for advice. Uh, we have a great relationship. He's my best friend, so we talk about anything and everything. And uh, when it comes to baseball, yeah, he uh, he's like the same with me. He's a little stubborn and hard headed, but he's getting better at at uh, you know kind of listening and not you know just taking everything and be like, oh no, I'm not going to do that. Um, so he he definitely you know he's listening now. He's asking questions. Uh, obviously, he wants to get to you know the point where I'm at right now and and being a big leaguer. And uh, I definitely believe he can do it. Yeah, that's so cool. I can just tell, like, when I ask you about him, like, you smile. Like, yeah. I can tell he's your guy. Like, <laughs> he is. Yeah, he is. And, you know, like I said, like, we have such a great re- relationship. Yeah. You know, it's not just baseball, you know, um, all the field as well. He's just, he's my best friend. Yeah, I love that. Um, now, you didn't play in the 2020 season because of COVID. How did you stay sharp during that time? Because, it, I mean, it was such a weird time for people in general, but to know that, like, you had to stay on top of things and be ready to go, like, next year and not lose a step. The biggest thing is you don't want to lose a step. What did you do to stay with it? Yeah. Um, so when we had the alternate site here in 2020, it was something that, you know, for me going into it, I wasn't really sure what it was going to be like, but – you know, looking back on it now, it really helped me improve my game. I feel like there was a lot of um, learning, um, a lot of kind of experimenting with my swing approach and all that stuff. And you have those moments to be able to do that, and you don't have the pressure of having to put up stats. And I think that was the best thing for me. Um, a lot of the young guys that were there was we were able to, you know, figure out these new things, kind of how to understand a little bit more the analytics of, you know, pitchers, pitch shapes and uh you know how to approach that and then being able to try different things without having the you know stats in the season to be like oh well this is actually worth something like no we're just kind of trying things out here yeah you speaking of that you've you know stepped into a new position playing the outfield what's it been like transitioning to that did you play some third base in college too no so i i never well or not in college i'm sorry the minor leagues (laughs) or minors oh i played i played third my in 2021 um when I got called up to triple a 
I played a little bit of third. I did, so I didn't play at all in double A or any time before that uh, in high school a little bit, but um, in pro ball, nothing. Just catcher and DH, catcher DH. Then 2021, I started to hit pretty decent. So when I got called up to AAA, like, hey, you know, you need another position just in case. Obviously, Salvi's here um, in Kansas City. So, you know, just in case, you know, something happens, whatever. So I started playing third base, learned that a little bit. I play, I think I played like nine or ten games at third. And uh, that next off season was, you know, doing some work at third base. Uh, and then, you know, we get to spring doing some stuff at third base and uh, get to the season and uh, start playing outfield. <laughs> no more third base. So, uh, And that was my first time ever playing outfield was in 20, yeah, 2022. That was last year, yeah. And uh, in AAA, I played two games and then got called up. <laughs> how's, it, how's it been? I mean, it's totally different. Even your view of the field when you're catching, you're looking at everything out. It's the total opposite when you're in the outfield. What's been the biggest transition for you? Yeah, um, honestly, just, you know, you're not – calling pitches I think calling pitches is probably like the biggest thing because you're literally involved in every single thing you're thinking the game your mind can never take a break whereas in the outfield you know you still have to stay in the game but it's not the same you're not thinking okay what am I going to call right here how am I going to set up this hitter so that's like the biggest difference um and then obviously you're kind of just staying out there you're not always you know you can there can be a game where a ball isn't hit to you at all so uh I think I had I think my first big league game in right field I don't think I even had a ball hit to me and you're like this isn't bad <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, well, this is definitely a change of pace. <laughs> That's funny. I think the the pace too. It's so reactionary when you're out there. Like you said, when you're behind the dish, you're you're calling things. You kind of you kind of know where things are going to go based on uh, on how the pitches are going, based on where the pitch is going. But in the outfield, like you're totally reacting to what is what just happened. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, you don't know you know what pitches come. You don't know like obviously you can kind of try to read the swings of the hitter. Like hey, if this guy's fouling balls off, you know and he's late and it's a righty and it's kind of going towards right field, hey, like, be ready. Um, but, yeah, like, you obviously you can be out there and kind of just – you can be, like, going through the motions, honestly, in a sense, and then a ball just hits you and you have to be ready for it. So it's just – it's staying locked in but in a different, you know, capacity. Yeah. Is there anything you do to help yourself stay locked in? Yeah, I try to just uh, – we give the outs. Obviously, the outfielders, We like, after every out is made, we kind of give the outs – um, you know, look at each other, hey, you know, move over a little bit, try to I try to really read the swing. So if a guy's late, maybe take a step to my left or to my right or whatnot. Um and try to do everything. You know, I look at the <laughs> I feel like every time a pitch is thrown, I look at the we have the metrics out in the outfield, so I just try to like look at that, okay, what pitch was that? Whatever. And I don't know, it helps me stay locked in, just being involved in everything. I've always sense. wanted to know this. When there's like a pitching change coming in and the infield kind of gets together and then the outfield gets together, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> Honestly, so many different things. Like <laughs> it really just depends and it depends who's out in the outfield. Like <laughs> um, sometimes we'll be like talk about the game. We'll talk about, all right, hey, like this hitter's coming up, like, you know, get to this position. I mean, there's this many outs, people on base. Or we'll be like, hey, like, I mean, that pitcher last inning was gross or, hey, good at bat or, you know, just like random stuff, honestly. It just depends. I'm just going to call you out. I bet you guys are out there being like, did you just see the hot dog race? <laughs> That's what you guys are probably talking about. No, yeah, we were talking about, yeah, hey, uh, I, you know, when that hot dog was coming around, I thought about just decking it. Yeah, <laughs> no. ketchup really, really kicked butt on that hot yeah. dog race. No, for sure, for sure. No, sometimes it's like random stuff. But, yeah. Hey. Can't, I can't tell all the secrets on here. No, that's true. That's true. We got to keep leave something to, you know, the imagination. I want to hear what it was like for you playing in the World Baseball Classic because that's such a cool opportunity. And I knew you were really pumped about it. I want to hear what it was like for you. Yeah, it was one of the craziest, loudest, most energetic experiences I've ever had. Um, you know, it felt like every game you're – in the middle of a concert and you're the one that you know is singing on stage and uh that's like the best way i can describe it it was you know you're playing for something a lot bigger than yourself um you know you got your country uh pride uh all that in you know kind of all in one setting uh you're the one representing that and, and for me that was super important you know especially my both my parents um being born and raised in puerto rico um, even though I wasn't necessarily born and raised there, I still, you know, have that, you know, that same kind of passion and pride. And that's what I grew up with, you know, uh, my heritage, you know, a lot of things we do at home, how I was raised it goes based off of that. And um, it was it was a real big honor for me, something that I had always wanted to do and uh, something that, you know, I can look back on and, uh, you know, smile on. And, uh, you know, I wish we would have won. Unfortunately, we didn't. But 
it was definitely still one of the best experiences I've ever had in baseball and in my life. You also got to be teammates with like some really cool people at the time. Francisco Lindor was a big one, of course. Um, what was it like to even just be temporary teammates with guys like that? Yeah, those are those are all stars. Those are guys that year in year out, you know, they are you know some of the best players in the game, and uh, I was able to learn a lot from those guys uh, on the field and honestly off the field. You know what they did to take care of, you know, the teams, the families, after games, you know, um, getting groups together, buying food, re- renting out restaurants um, for all the families. Like, that's something that, you know, you don't always see. And, you know, especially as a, as a young player, you're trying to learn, you know, what do I need to do to become a leader, to become, um, you know, that guy that everybody looks up to, you know, once I have many years in the show like they do. And those are things that I can look back on and, you know, learn from and, uh, you know, they're they're great leaders, you know, the things that they did, you know, the clubhouse too, taking the young guys under their wings, talking to us, um, and just, you know, being there for us, being friendly. Those were uh, some really cool things that, uh, you know, I'll never forget. Um, it did have one negative impact on you and that it, you dyed your hair blonde. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's a negative. It's like a positive. <laughs> Speak but for yourself. Yeah, it's uh no, it's still we still got a little bit left. You do. But, yeah, but that it's, was a team uh, thing, right? Yeah, it was. It was. Um, and for me, like I've always kind of like liked having a little bit longer hair, so it's taking a little bit of time to grow out. But um, it's yeah, it's growing out a little bit. It'll it'll be sad whenever it's completely gone. I'll be sad at least. You I could always like it. keep dying it. No, I don't think I'm gonna do that. I don't want to fry. That's the whole reason too why I haven't dyed it back is because like I don't want to keep processing my hair. I'm just gonna like. Let it grow out and just keep cutting it. He's he's worried about the hair health, guys. Exactly, exactly. You were telling me you do like a hair mask sometimes to keep. Yeah, the- yeah, I do a little little uh, deep conditioning treatment. There we go. Hey, I try to I try to keep you know all that stuff underlined. Like, hey, it's all important. Yes. Yeah, exactly. We need to do a new segment, um, hair health or or self care with MJ. Maybe <laughs> self care. That's a good one. I like that. <laughs> self care. Yeah, we talk about you know keeping your hair good. You know, having to get my my weekly haircut. Yes. Keeping a good lineup, which I don't have right now, but you know that's going to happen either today or tomorrow. So you got to give me a little bit of slack on that. But hey, we're good there. All right, we'll let it slide this time. Uh, speaking of accessories, you are known for your necklaces, yeah. your chains, <laughs> um, and you have like a lineup of them. And you like mix them around and like what you wear. Like today, you're just wearing the single one, but there's sometimes during games where you're be wearing like three at once. Yeah, yeah. I try to switch it up. I try to you know keep different looks see for me like i feel like wearing the same thing all the time gets boring yeah like, for sure so i try to switch it up like you'll see me like on the road and even home games sometimes i'll wear like the baby blue sleeve uh you know we wear the all gray uniforms i'll wear the baby blue arm sleeve whenever we wear you know the all white sometimes i'll do the baby blue last two games i did like the royal so i just like to switch it up you know keep different looks obviously with the necklaces the chains um i have the one that right now that i've you know had since i got drafted um, this one has a little bit of sentimental value towards it, but um, also, you know, I have like my 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 diamond Cuban one that I wear. I have uh, ones that my friend makes that are called uh, these the poly necklaces that uh-huh. um, are also like really shiny, and uh, those are pretty cool too. And I like that. I have a lot of different colors of those ones, so I like to switch those up too. So just kind of keep in a different rotation of it. So how do you decide? Do you just like whatever you're feeling? You just come in. You don't like pre-plan it, do you? Um, you have like a schedule in your locker or something? No, so I don't. So no, I don't have a schedule, but <laughs> I do have. You know those little mannequin things that you see at the jewelry store, where it's literally just like a, a like a mini torso. Yeah, like I've a ne- seen it in there. Okay, yeah. yeah. So I have one of those um, that Stony, our our strength coach, actually got me because he was <laughs> really? like, yeah, he was like, he was like, yeah, well, you need one of these in your locker so you could just display them all. You know, you can have what you're wearing for the game, what you're not wearing. Mm. So yeah, uh, big shout out to him, and yeah, ever since he got me that, I've I just set them on there, and I'll just kind of look at them like, oh, let me see what would look good today, and I try to, you know, sometimes I'll match up with the uniform, the baby blues, or sometimes I'll go like completely different. Yeah, yeah, and you got to take care of them too when they're sitting there. They're sitting nicely. They're not all like bunched up. Exactly, exactly. It's got to look clean still, you know, even though my locker may not be the cleanest, but that's got to at least look good. And uh, it's got to be right there in the center of everything. All right. That makes sense. Now, how important are accessories to when you're playing? Because I know for a fact you have, uh, like, for example, your gloves, your batting gloves. You have this thing where you don't Velcro them. Yeah. That's a superstition, right? Yes and no. So, yeah, it kind of is a superstition. But at the same time, I just like the way it feels. Like I don't like the, you know, the strap that batting goes. I feel like it's too much compression on my wrist. I feel like too tight. So I don't like it. And I'd been doing that ever since like the seventh grade. So I was like, 
I'm just gonna keep it now. And then I have to cut them too because I guess last year the umpire was like, oh, well, if you get hit by pitch on that, then you know it's we can't call it a hit by pitch or something. I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll just cut it. So I, I cut them now a little bit shorter so that you know they can't the umpires can't say that and I don't have to strap them up because last year there was like three or four at bats where they made me strap them up and I was kind of annoyed. Yeah, I was just going to ask you if an ump has ever like told you that you have to do it. Yeah, it happened. And it only happened like once in high school ever. And I remember I was so mad. So I did, I strapped them up. I ended up hitting a triple. And when I got to third base, I did like a like this. and all. Yeah, it was so petty. It was so petty. I'm <laughs> looking back on it now. But I was so upset. And I was like, I unstrapped them like really hard and just like looked at the umpire. It was good luck though, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it ended up working out that time but uh yeah, and definitely if I can leave them unstrapped I will yeah now when Salvi had some some time when he was out last year you and Bobby graciously like took over the splash duties what was the thinking going into that you guys are like the splash bros I don't know what you guys call yourselves but why did you guys want to take that on and what's it been like carrying the torch in that sense yeah it's definitely um Definitely a little bit of pressure on yeah. it, to be honest with you. So I've always been doing that. That's been his trademark for, you know, as long as I can remember. And uh, I don't know. I don't even remember, like, the very first time that we did it. But I just remember, like, yeah, because Salvia's hurt. was like, well, somebody's got to do it. So me and Bobby were like, all right, let's carry it. Because it was probably too heavy for either of us to carry on our own. It was the <laughs> first time. Salvia's a lot bigger and stronger than us. So, um, no, we did that. And then ever since, you know, all the, the home game ones, we do it. On the road, we don't really do it as much. I don't think – I don't know if Salvi did it on the road or not. But, um, yeah, we do it on the home games. And it's been fun. Like, you kind of mix up the Gatorade. Sometimes we'll put, like, seeds or, like, gum or um, the Sour Patch Kids in, inside a thing. Kind of, you know, s- switch it up a little bit. Yeah, you know, I've seen – Salvi has really, like, he's very methodical about it. He has really good aim. You guys, your aim isn't always, like, the best. No. The first, like, like the first couple of times, Bobby would, like, pour it way too early. Yes. And it would, like, get, you know, he would get it all over my leg. Or all my cleats would be, you know, just soaked with Gatorade. Yeah. I'm like, dude, you got to just, like, time it up better. And you're getting it all over Joel. Like, come on. Well, who cares about that? <laughs> Joel, we can get Joel wet. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. It's, it's only, like, a nice suit that you're potentially ruining. Hey, that's, <laughs> that's on him. All right. As long as the cameras are fine, I think we're good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you guys have definitely come a long way because, it, like you said, it's heavy. And it can be hard to maneuver that. You guys have gotten better at it. Yeah, so. no, we've gotten better. Bobby's come up with some pretty cool ideas, too, where he'll get, like, one of the smaller coolers, and I'll get another small cooler, and we'll just, you know, do a, do a different, like, attack scheme. Yeah, you've been tricky about it, that's for sure. Um, one other thing I've noticed is that you, one of the things that you have, like, in your profile for Twitter and some other things is Be The Light. Mm-hmm. What does that mean to you? Why yeah. is it important to you? So that's something that's important to me that um, I think kind of came along – I don't know if it was my first year. I think it was probably my first year in pro ball. Um, and I just remember I was like, I want something that, you know, can kind of represent who I am and, you know, my faith. Um, and for me, I just remember being in church one day and I was like, hmm, I was trying to think of something. And that was just like the message today is just be the light in Matthew five sixteen. Um, I think I have that one in my, in my Instagram bio as well. I have another one and I have another favorite too. So, um, and that's just like, let my light so shine that so that others may see my good deeds and glorify my father in heaven. So that's something that's important for me and just, you know, kind of playing the game. Obviously a lot of people are watching you always and kind of just like being that light, just trying to always, you know, remember why I'm here, who I'm representing and, uh, you know, sharing that. And obviously it's not an easy game. Um, it's definitely hard. Uh, and you know, there's going to be times where you're struggling a lot, but you gotta try to just, you know, keep that, you know, keep that in the back of your head and, uh, Remember that, you know, people are always watching. You got to, you know, represent you, yourself and, uh, you know, as the best way as possible. And the game, even if you play, you know, 10 years in the big leagues, 19 years like Granke, uh, it can't go on forever. So it's like one of those things where you have to remember what are you going to do afterwards and what do you want to be known for? So what do you think you would want to do after baseball? Do you want to coach like your dad? Oh, that's such a tough question. Um, I don't know. Honestly, that's... If you ask me that right now, I'd probably say no. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, maybe years on down the line, you know, maybe that changes. Uh, yeah, it just, it just depends, you know, where I'm at, where I'm at in my life, you know, what I got going on, uh, you know, hopefully family and kind of see how, how all that plays out. So we'll see. That's that's a question for later on down the road. I all think. right. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. Are you ready for our lightning round? Y- maybe. All right. Well, <laughs> the answer is yes. 
Uh, how many necklaces are too many necklaces? Oh, I used to say like th three was too many, but I'd say now I'm going to say four because I wear three sometimes. <laughs> I've seen you with three. I've never seen you with more than three. I, yeah, I think I think three is like good enough. I think four is too many. I think we should get a weight on you before the necklace and then put the necklaces on and, and then get after. a weight after. Yeah, I'll be a little bit heavier. Yeah, you would for <laughs> sure. Do you have a welcome to the big leagues moment? Oh, um... Obviously, debut doesn't count. That's literally my welcome to the big yeah. leagues. But uh, um, I think so. We had a double header against the White Sox, and I caught the first game. Salvi was supposed to catch the second, but I think he—I don't know if he got hit by pitch or something—but he ended up getting hurt. I remember this game. Yeah. So I had to catch both Two, games, yeah. eighteen innings in a day, and I caught the next game. Um, because they asked me, you know, are you okay? You know, we can give you off day. And I was like, no, I want to catch. Yeah. And that was also the day that I hit my first big league homer. So that was, uh, that was probably my welcome to the big leagues moment. Yeah. That's cool. Hard work rewarded for sure. Yes. Thankfully. Um, what's the most listened to song on your playlist or what kind of music are you bumping to in your car? Oh, um, probably the most listened to is Mike. Uh, so I used to go by Mike stud. Now it's just like Mike with a period at the end. Um, and he's probably my favorite right now. I feel like I can jam to his music really in whatever kind of mood I am. He used to be like more rap. Now it's like uh, a little bit more, you know, pop rap, kind of, you know, a little bit more subtle stuff. Good vibes. Great car ride vibes, especially like windows down. Yeah, probably my favorite. Good vibes. Oh, yeah. That That's should, the best way to describe it, honestly. I that know should be so the cliche, title of your memoir. <laughs> Good vibes. Be. The MJ Melendez story. 100%. <laughs> All right, what was your first job? This. We like <laughs> Playing, it. Being a professional baseball hey, player. That's not bad. What was your first car? Uh, 2012 Dodge Challenger when I turned 16 my dad got it for me. So What a present. Yeah, I, yeah I definitely. I was a little bit spoiled. So uh, thanks, Pops, for that one. And uh, definitely had a lot of emotional value, sentimental value. And I was definitely sad when I uh, got rid of it. Did you, once you signed, I hope you repaid the favor and got him something nice, did you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Both of my parents were taken care of. They uh, they got some nice stuff, so uh, I uh, I think they're they're pretty happy with, with how it's turned out. Good. What was the first thing that you kind of splurged uh, after you signed? A lot of people buy a car. The chain? This is my first thing. All right. First thing Less practical, like, I'm just going to say. First thing and like only thing for a while. I actually, okay, so this is pretty cool. That I don't know if a lot of people know. My, a lot of my teammates know, but I didn't get a new car until I made the 40-man roster okay. in, in 22. So I tried. I was like, I'm not going to get a new car until I make it to the big leagues. Like, that was my big thing. I was like, I'm not going to do it, not going to do it, not going to do it. And uh, in 20, after 21, I was like, okay, I had a good season, like, you know, I made the 40 man roster then and I you get was a pay like, bump. I, I feel like I feel like I, I was, you know, reward myself as getting to as close to big leagues as possible. And I was like, hopefully it happens during the season next year. And if it does, then I don't want to be in my old car. So, <laughs> so I was like, OK, I'll, I'll get it now. And uh, so I waited as pretty much as long as possible. There you go. But you got that chain. But I got the chain. Yeah, the chain <laughs> was the first thing. <laughs> I love it. All right. That's going to wrap up our episode. Thank you so much, MJ, for being with us today. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Is there anything you want them, the fans to know before you leave? Or you want to leave your Instagram handle so they know where they you can find they can find you? Yeah. And it's at MJ Melinda 7 And uh, to all the fans, you know, we love you. Uh, thank you guys for always supporting us. And, uh, you know, we're, we're bringing some wins coming soon. You know, don't lose faith in us. We love you guys. All right, MJ, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. It was so great to have you. Make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. We've got episodes coming your way all the time. I've been your host, Carrie Lipper-Gillespie, and we will see you next time.